Hello, this is Ulysses McLaren recording live from, uh, from NDC Sydney. Today I'm joined by Richard Campbell, who's the best known as one half of the team behind .NET Rocks podcast. So Richard is an architecture and infrastructure consultant, as well as a Microsoft regional director and MVP. So Richard, thank you for joining me today. My pleasure, Yuli. Uh, so today we're going to be chatting about how to have a great career in software development. Yeah, I don't even know if I know anything about that, to well, be honest. That's right. I'll just talk. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's such a subjective term. Completely, yeah. You know? So what do you think, first off, what is, what is success? How do you define success? I think that's an incredibly personal concept of what, what makes you successful. You have children, and they're relatively young, as I, as yeah, I yeah. so you know, your world completely changed a few years ago when your children arrived. Like suddenly your priorities of success are utterly different. And that, I think that's part of the challenge when you think about a career is your own goals for a career are going to change as you progress through it. Right. So the, it, you know, I, I can't give you correct answers because there's no such thing. You have to, this is, this is leadership of your own life and you, you've got to decide what mountain matters to you. I, I would, if I give you any advice, it's like be aware, your goal will change. Like yeah. that's absolutely inevitable. So don't hold too strongly to any given well, goal? I think the more important thing is you don't get to make a plan in uni and execute it on the rest of your life, right? You're, you're gonna be pretty unhappy with the results. That leadership of your own life is something you have to access on a routine basis. Once a year or twice a year, you gotta take some time to stop doing the work, stop managing your life and focus on where you're going. You know, the, 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 the third distinction, I'm, and I'm using Covey terms here, is this idea of, you know, you're down in the jungle with a machete, chopping away, right? That is what we do most of the time. We do the work, right? We mm. plow through. But every so often, you need to climb up the tree, figure out which way we're going, whatever right, okay. that may be. So well, how, do you, how do you point your compass? Like, there's the cookie cutter kind of build. Everyone thinks, okay, you know, I need to be... Uh, if you're a software developer, you need to be a manager of software developers, or you need to be a yeah, which I think is somewhat of a fallacy, right? right? I, I do think in the early stages of a, of a software development career, you start out, you think about what you loved first. You did love programming, mm. you know, and it, and it's crazy to talk about, but it's like that love is going to fluctuate over time, in, in for different reasons. So initially, we're pursuing a set of skills, creating some code. I mean, what do you actually want when you think about goals? You talk about building something meaningful. Right? I was responsible for this piece of code that did this thing that was important you know, to the customer, that made a difference in the world. Right? And, and you see heartbroken developers when they work hard on a project that never sees the light of day. Yeah. It's like if programming was all that mattered, then you wouldn't care what happened to the code after you programmed it. But utilization of your code is what actually matters. And so sometimes you get that positive reinforcement from an open source project where you see other people that are forking your code and that are participating in your code. Like that's powerful. Or it's the, the acclamation of your peers or the customers that are using your project. You know, I think at an early stage of your career, that's going to motivate you the most. Now, you brought up an interesting thing, which is this idea of management, because there is this sort of, I think, fallacious no uh, concept that the only way we will grow mm -hmm. is to manage others. And if you look at the most sophisticated companies in the world around growth in technology, there tends to be two stacks. So this is true at places like Microsoft, it's true at places like Apple, uh, and I think many companies have to look really closely at this because it's an important concept. The idea of the difference between an individual contributor and a, a manager or a leader of contributors. Because they are different jobs. Yeah. And they're both important. Like we, you know, a bicycle is pretty hard to use if you don't have both a steering wheel and a pedal, right? Both pieces are necessary. Doing the work, writing the code, is that head down, pedaling activity. Steering the bike, deciding what needs to be built, and making sure that people can build it well, is that head up, steering the bike activity, mm. right? And there's always a ratio to that. You know, one leader can support and I say support for a reason, because leaders are worthless without workers. Workers are useful without leaders. They're just not as useful as they could be. Mm. So you get six to one, maybe eight to one, of someone who can lead a team versus the, the six or eight people that can do the work. Right? Now, this presumption that because it's scarcer, that there's fewer managers, they are more valuable, again, inaccurate. Mm. Right? That's not actually the point. That shouldn't be your path of promotion. You should be able to 
as an individual contributor, as someone with skills, grow in your career, grow in your expertise, grow in your contributions while continuing to be an individual contributor. It seems stunningly foolish to me that someone who's talented in their work, that is great at writing code, that has got great skill, that the only way they can be promoted is to stop doing that yeah. and start doing something you're just not that good at. Yeah, right. but isn't that growth? Like, if you want to grow in your career, you have to get out of your comfort zone, which means you need to do more of the things that you're less comfortable doing. I totally agree, but you can be uncomfortable as an individual contributor too. New technologies, new techniques. The question is, is what actually motivates you, what inspires you, what feels like success, hmm. the things you create or the people you support? And it's not a straight line. Hmm. Like, I have also seen people who need to create things. Like, that's the only way they feel supported, effective, useful, and need good leaders working with them to be successful at that. And then after time, that no longer inspires. That I've made the things I want to make. I know I can make these things. And actually, the only thing that excites me is helping others make the things they've always wanted to make. Now you're growing into a leader. Right. But that's not the only path. Yeah, yeah. Right? Like, I don't want to ever put certainty around this. The only thing I've learned 40 years of doing this stuff is I don't know, <laughs> right? That I am sure there's more ways to do this. I've seen extraordinarily successful people that have reached the very heights of their industry and never taken a leadership role. Right. Not in that sense, that they were responsible for others' productivity. They may have been great mentors mm -hmm. because they do have a lot of knowledge about technology and they can help in sort of that mentorship style way as opposed to I stop writing code or I stop making this thing and my responsibility is this group of people who do make those things yeah so I don't want to say like that's what you got to do because it's not true right I've seen both success I've also seen folks who are not natural creators but are shepherds of people that are great at growing people's skills at having an eye for what's holding them back and how to push to the next stage you know a Great athlete requires a great coach, but a great coach doesn't have to be a great athlete. And so you don't have to be the best program in the room as the leader of the team. Mm. In fact, it's counterproductive for you to be. That's because good news for me. I'm a terrible programmer. I've heard rumors. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <right? laughs> but at the same time, you've met, I, I know great developers that have certain leaders or certain program managers that it's like, if I don't have that person on my team, I'm not doing this. Like it, they learn enough to know I can trust you as the head up person that my work is not wasted mm. and that if I have a problem, you'll take care of it and that you are that umbrella for the detritus that goes on in any operation so that I can focus on the things that are the most important. Yeah, absolutely. Right? You are in service to others. Now, ultimately, we all are, right? I mean, in the end, whether you create something for other, you know, you're making it for someone else. Mm. You are in service to others, right? It's just a first order or second order question, right? Your only metric success as a, as a supporting developers is how successful they are. Yes. Right? I mean, the nice thing about an individual contributor is they can make their piece. And they say, there is my contribution. Ah, right. Right? Now, so direct control over what they're doing. But, or at least they feel like it. Now, yeah. it's, it's got its own logical fallacy because you can make this magical thing amongst this pile of disaster and it'll never amount to anything. Mm. Like you actually, that's why you see good individual contributors that demand certain managers because they know they won't be wasting their time. Yeah. Right? But a manager shows nothing without being able to lead their people successfully and making sure they're successful. Yeah. Right? I think one of the illnesses we have in our industry is people try to do both at the same time. Right. And it's poison. Because it basically, you know, it's like, it's, it's like any of those stereo equipment. You know, we used to have a record player and a tape player in it, which pretty much guaranteed both of them were lousy. Yeah. Right? Like, <laughs> Because you can't do both. One's a head down activity, writing code. One's a head, activi uh, head up activity. Are we hitting our milestones? Where are we stuck? And you, you simply can't do both at the same time. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a logical, your, your brain just breaks. You're, so you're gonna do both poorly. Right, interesting. So you have taken obviously a very uh, public path yes. in your career. Mm -hmm. uh, and you've built a profile and, and a lot of your success has come from, the, from the, uh, the fact that you're really out there, everyone knows who you are. Do you think that's something that everyone needs to do? No, not or, at all. Or to some extent, or not at all? Yeah, I mean, I'm anomalous in the sense that I fell in love with telling stories more than anything else, right? I mean, I really enjoy software, but I like the stories of how we make influence over things. And if you look at everything that I do these days, it's a forms of storytelling. 
So, I mean, I'm lucky in the sense that I learned that about myself, mm. that that storytelling was, a, was my joy. And that, so, you know, storytelling is two acts, right? Gathering the story, you know, forming it in your mind and then sharing it. Mm. So for me, that became the passion. But most people aren't like that and I don't expect anyone to want to do that. But there is this sort of idea that unless I stand in front of the crowd, unless I am, you know, banging on the table and being the noisy one, I'm never going to progress. And I, I don't think that's true either. Okay. Um, some of the most effective leaders in an organization I've ever met write good documents. You know, a really well-crafted document that inspires is, I think, 10 times more effective than any presentation I could do on stage. Right. You only get a power of my presentation on stage if you're there. Documents execute in parallel. You can have a hundred people reading at the same time, being inspired simultaneously, and it persists. So don't presume that you have to be the dancing bear. Mm. You know, there are many other ways to influence and inspire that don't involve that. I don't think I've ever heard anyone get that excited about documentation before. <laughs> <laughs> but you know why? We haven't put enough energy into it. A really great document is emotional, is inspirational. It takes time to in persuade. The problem is that all too often we have, we're sort of wrapped in this academic third person mindset. It's the moment we start typing. Most entertaining guy in the world to sit across the table at a dinner, the moment he picks up a keyboard, he talks like he's a fifth grade science teacher who hates his job. <laughs> like, what are you doing? Like, write the same inspiration that you have, that you're, you know, put that enthusiasm into words, right? And I think one of the reasons that people resist that is because writing isn't ephemeral, mm. because it does persist. And so that's a little, where when you put your emotions down on paper, just like you put them in a blog post, like they suddenly have a stabilizing property and you're stuck being that person where spoken word goes away. Well, nowadays, I mean, SSW has SSW TV, which sure. is what's recording right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've found, because we, we've been doing user groups and, and the mini version of what you're doing um, for a while. And you're right, it was ephemeral. We would talk to the 20 people in the room and then, you know, next month you've got to start again. Right. So we started recording it, we started putting it online. So now with video as a thing that's out there, do you think that the spoken word has become more valuable? Uh, Sort of. I mean, the problem is you, you, you now have to think about how often is that actually watched? How well does it actually persuade? Mm. We are living in a time of limited attention, right? Attention is now the capital, yeah. right? Like that's the rarest, scarcest resource you now own is your attention. And so my biggest concern is you just don't give things enough attention, right? And so, yeah, we can make video and so forth. But the real question is, are they actually paying attention to it? Mm. Plays are not enough. You know, we don't actually know if they've consumed it. Now, writing is not hip this, th these days that much. Most people prefer to listen to something and thank goodness I make podcasts yeah. <laughs> or watch something because it's a less active process than reading. But I also think they don't learn as effectively hmm. I mean, for a couple of reasons. One is you dumb down video. You keep it short. You can only hit one point. A lot of the texture isn't there. You are also setting the pacing with a video. You can only watch as fast as that thing plays. Turning it up is kind of weird, right? You could tweak a podcast and listen at 1.5, you know, and suddenly my resonant voice sounds like a chipmunk, <laughs> but you know, you're somewhere. You know we do that? Uh, yeah, we absolutely do that. Uh, it's one of the set reasons I speak so slowly. I'm still understandable at that speed. Um, writing is the, my favorite input device because I get to set the speed. I read very quickly, mm. right? So I get more detail, more texture, more ability to continue to consume, and, and I learn more as well. So, you know, people trying to figure out, people are kind of stunned that I know a fair number of things that I could speak on a large variety of topics comes from reading. Yeah, right. And so, uh, uh, but I only bring up the, the Word document perspective and so forth is to say, again, there isn't one right way through any career. There isn't one right way to be an influencer. There are other mediums that matter. Yeah. And so you've got to lean on the medium that resonates with you, that works more effectively, that inspires. So what you're saying is if most people have a terrible fear of public speaking, they don't actually need to public speak. No, it, don't presume it's a requirement. Now, I'm big on facing fear, but that only means you get up the first time, right? And your fear will diminish. The real question is, does it inspire you? So I, as a high school kid, wasn't into theater. I, well, I was in the sense that I was a technician. I was a stage manager. 
because I liked electronics. And so I was good at keeping gear running. I liked hanging around with stage people, but I didn't particularly want to be one. What I didn't know is that I have a chemical reaction to applause. That after right. I did that a talk and people <laughs> applaud, I'm like, I want more of that, right? That rush. But I've also met pl plenty of folks that simply don't have that effect. That the stress of getting to the presentation and getting the presentation done, they are relieved when they're not done, not delighted. Why would you keep doing it if it doesn't delight you? So I don't want people to twist their brains up because they think there's some power in doing this that isn't true. There are other ways to inspire and influence, right? Stage is just one. It's an easily visible one. It's also one that people often think, oh, I want to do that. And then they get up there and go, maybe I don't. And it may not get better. Like, without a doubt, there's practice. You know, I've certainly had people come to me and says, I, I don't know why you're so fearless. Like, why, are you worried about messing up? It's like, am I afraid of dying? <laughs> no, you know why? I've died a lot, right? The only reason that I'm so comfortable on stage now is that I've messed up so many times, I just, I know it's, it can't get as bad as something that's already happened, mm. right? I've been through all of that. But I only kept going back because the effect it had on me was something I enjoyed, right? I am very pleased when I can communicate a story well that resonates with people, that I can see it on their faces, that they, they send tweets about it, that they ask me questions about it. That, to me, is, is delightful. I yeah. want more of that. But that is not everybody. Right, okay. Um, so in, in a path to, to progressing your career, do you think that the, the best path is to stick with one company and work your way through that company or to jump around a lot? Uh, I don't think, again, there's easy answers either there. The question is, can you progress? And what does progression look like to is you? Is there space in that company? Well, and often we, we struggle as an industry with communicating the idea to the non-technical people that we want to progress, mm. right? They, you know, we are in a situation where most people don't understand what they, we do. And if they don't understand what you do every day, why would they understand why, how you'd want to get better at it or how you'd like to evolve in it? So it's a, it's a challenging set of problems in the sense that you are speaking a different language than everyone else. And so your needs around that are going to be difficult to communicate to most people. And I think it's one of the reasons that you do see a very standard pattern where people move from company to company because it's easier to progress that way. Yeah, right. We find a company who's already describing the next job we want, and so we go there. I think company owners, and I've been there several times, have to learn the cost of the restart of new employees routinely to recognize that it's worth spending energy making sure there are career paths within the company. It's just, it's not trivial. Mm. And they do, you know, we also have this luxury in our industry of there perpetually being a shortage of skilled people. And so there is always a choice to move on. Yeah. And if you don't, you know, the, the joke is, if you can't change your company, change your company, right? So you have that choice of either finding a way forward inside of the company or going and finding another company. Right, and, and in our industry, progression can often mean just doing interesting work. That Absolutely, and, it's, it, as a, and as a business leader, like I've worked with plenty of companies that do really cool projects. And while it looks like fun, it's also incredibly stressful because the kind of people that wanna work on those cool projects that's pretty much the only thing they're gonna to wanna to work on. Mm. So unless you can keep up with the pipeline of marquee projects all the time, they're gonna move on, mm. right? Again, we have this problem where the non-technical people don't understand the sort of specializations and interests that these folks have. The folks I've worked with that are great at building compilers, that's what they like doing. But the problem is that compilers get finished. Mm. And then they're kinda of like, well, where's the next compiler? It's like, well, why don't you work on this other thing? It's like, no, I kind of like working on compilers. And, then, and there's not very many of me, so I'm going to go over there and work on compilers instead. And so, you know, that's something that, that most people really struggle with. Like, you, you, you know, a developer is not a developer, not a developer. You can't just plug them into anything they want. Yeah. They pick up specialties, they pick up inspirations. I mean, it's no different than liking to present on stage. That is an anomalous specialty. Right? And it's a narrow niche, and you've got to go find opportunities in it. Same is true of someone who's great at front-end design, or someone's brilliant at, at compiler design, or someone that's a, effective at, at data storage. 
Right? All of those are specialized skills that you're going to want to continue to exercise for some period of time. You also get tired of skills, right? Mm. You get less interested in things, and then you're going to go start cultivating a new one. So that's the go wide or go deep question. Well, and again, I don't think it's certain on either one of those, right? I've certainly followed the paths of careers of people that inspired me where they took a time where they really wanted to invent something, and so they focused on that and they built a set of skills to execute on that. When they finished that, then they took that knowledge and used it as a leader to inspire a group of other people and led them for a couple of years and helped them grow and create something new. And then move back to, you know, I like managing people, but I've done it for a while and I'm tired and I want to go make something again. And then they switch back to that individual contributor on a different set of skills and move forward again. Right. So you've been working on .NET Rocks for a long time. Yes. Um, in that, obviously, the specialization there is interviewing, is presenting. Yes. Um, and it's not necessarily coding. No. So, but you're still very technical. How do you stay technical and stay relevant in a world of a thousand different technologies. Uh, you've got to have the hobbies that keep feeding that thing, right? Like, look, I would not hire me to write production code today, right? <laughs> right? I could probably pull off leading a team, but my coding skills are way too rusty. The last chunks of code I've written are like Python automation code for my house, which I enjoy doing, Yeah. right? But there's a difference between being in the groove of a modern, of being able to work in a team of modern developers with proper practices. You know, that takes a fair chunk of your time up. And I found myself in a niche where I have, I serve a, I think I serve a useful skill to my community in that I am being fed from a lot of different sources, yeah. all the things that are happening in our industry, and I get to sort them out and build them into story arcs to help you grasp how cloud adoption is taking place, where DevOps is being slotted in. Like all, all, you know, for me, when I think about making podcasts and conferences, I'm working in a series of story arcs with topics that represent the evolution of our industry. Hmm. And I, I love that I get that job because it's a job I adore. Like that's super fun, but there's no, you don't need very many of me two or three, hmm. right? Where you need many more skilled developers that can work together in teams and actually build the stuff. So and if, I, if I'm serving any purpose here, it's I'm helping to triage what you need to know next as a developer. Absolutely, which is my next question. Yeah. So what do we need to know next? If, if you're a developer who's looking for the next thing to really dive deep on, mm -hmm. that's gonna be in a lot of uh, demand in the next five years. Time horizons are question. an interesting challenge, okay? Hey, look, we are clearly at a turning point in web development between WebAssembly and, and progressive web apps. The idea of the browser as the host for the smart client is pretty much coming to pass. You need to take your existing set of skills and press against these new things and make new demands on what that should look like. Uh, you know, JavaScript has never been better than it is right now. And you, know, you, and you can get away from the browser if you want and go look at Electron and say, hey, same set of skills, now I'm compiling directly to an array of desktops if I want to do that. Uh, and all of those things are emotion, they are interesting. And those are immediate. That's stuff you could be doing today. When you start thinking on the five-year time horizon, you're, I'm looking for disruptions. Mm. So for me, the most stable part of the technological arc that's going on in the world right now is the smartphone. The smartphone has basically been the same since the iPhone shipped in 2007. It's a slab of black glass. It gets bigger, it gets smaller, it gets fewer cameras, more cameras, but it's essentially a slab of black glass. Now, it has succeeded in changing civilization. The majority of adult humans on this planet now have this device. And it is now presented more information availability, more communication ability than ever before. Our world is different. And there are interesting manifestations of what that looks like. You watch a Ugandan farmer with 2G on an old style cell phone, but still able to get accurate weather reports from it, deciding when to plant. And basically guaranteeing a yield every year. His famines are over, right? That is a fundamental shift in society, right? And then there's Candy Crush, so not everything <laughs> is smart. So actually, on, on that, we, we obviously were a software consultancy. We, yeah. we get a, a feeling for the demand of the industry by just the kinds of projects that turn up at our door. Yes. Um, and we obviously thought mobile development was going to be a huge area. Yes. And we've had remarkably few people wanting to build big mobile apps. Good. Right. But, so, but the, the mobile device is the device that is stable, that is there. But yes. mobile development's not. No, because the, because the app stores suck. 
right? right? <laughs> because the model of putting software onto the phone is terrible, right? And so where the opportunity space is in mobile, now, and again, you're talking trailing indicators, mm. customer demand, as opposed to leading indicators, all right? So in the trailing indicator perspective, what we want is low cost, low pain ability to communicate with customers via the mobile device, and that's web. Right, and now you talk about the basics of PWAs where I want web, but I need an icon on the phone. Well, okay, well, I'll get that out of a manifest, right? And that, that solves that basic problem. And it should be able to tolerate irregular connectivity and it shouldn't lose messages mm. and all those things. I mean, PWA addresses an awful lot of that. So that's fine. The, the bigger issue uh, there is this is commodity, spending money on it is foolish, right? You've got to minimize your cost moving forward for being connected to those things. So right. all of your stuff, you know, if you're not testing everything you make to communicate with customers on a phone, you're just leaving money on the table. It's, that's a silly thing to do. Right. right. This is the primary medium. It should, be, it should be your extraordinary experience. It should be the first order experience. The challenge, of course, is that many developers have not grappled with the idea that the machine you develop on is not the machine that is consumed on. Right? It's, a, it's a fundamental schism, and it only really started with mobile. I mean, most of, anybody who's been developing for 10 plus years spent at least part of their time working on exactly the same kind of computer as the consumers of their product were working on, right? Regular web pages, regular apps, mm. that's what you thought. And you have to get past that because the primary consumption of the consumer facing is not that machine, it's this machine. But mobile first. Exactly. And so, I mean, we say that very tritely, and then we don't do it. Yeah. Okay. But again, we talk about a five-year time horizon. What you really got to talk about is what disrupts the phone. Because, because the phone is essentially static. Are you thinking the HoloLens? I'm thinking visor. Right. right. And five years might be a little tight. But that's sort of secondary to the point. Right? You can always have this game of is it a Newton or is it an iPhone when you look at any given piece of hardware. Because not everything made, Apple ever made was perfect. Right? The Newton was too far ahead of its time. Newton means you've come up with an idea, you've pushed the edges of technology, but its adoption path is too severe and it doesn't happen. Too early on the hype train. Exactly. Then we're clearly there. Right now we're in that, we're even pre-Newton. Like we're in the feeling around, does this make sense? But from a developer's perspective, we talk about skills perspective, given that this makes sense. So let's, I don't want to talk about HoloLens specifically, but talk about Visor as a whole, mm -hmm. all right? This concept of, I'm now going to have something on my face. Now, why, would, why in the world would I do that in the first place? It's got to be better than this, first and foremost. So everything that does and more. So let's start with the simplest thing they could possibly do. The fact that it's on your face means that it has a three-dimensional view of the world around you. So first off, it's going to stop you from walking into traffic when you're looking at your phone too much. Right? No more of that. Now you're actually going to be looking up, but still not paying attention at your messages and, and candy crush and thing, but you're, at least your visor is looking out the rest of the world. It's like, that's a red light, dude. You should stop. <laughs> so that's you know, a simple thing, although I would wonder if that's like the profound thing in some respects. That will grab you first. Certainly the ability to provide ambient compute. We've talked for years as technologists about this concept of agency, that software would simply serve us. Mm -hmm. The problem is that we keep it in our pocket so it doesn't know what the heck's going on. Right? We have to feed it information and then it's not in position to actually help us. Once it's on our face, it's able to see the world around you. So it's now giving me immediately that this is your name, here's the names of your children, this is where you live. So, yeah. you know, we could appear to have an intimate conversation just because we're being fed more information about each other. I mean, that's an interesting aspect of that. Yeah, and what, it sees what you see, it hears what you hear. Exactly, and so, like, like you see the popularity of dash cams in cars mm -hmm. these days? Well, what if you had a dash cam on your head, <laughs> right? And for that- Permanent GoPro. Well, and, and, so, and for that simple reason of you never know when you wished you had a copy of what just happened, right? Or in, in that immediate future. So naturally, it's going to be scrolling off if you're not paying attention to it. But when you are, we do, do set its value. It's like, hey, take the list, that last 10 minutes, file it under X, mm. and then you have it. So augmented reality, you're thinking, is the next UI yes. interface. What about, I mean, the big elephant in the room when anyone talks about career at the moment is AI. Right. Like, is this job even going to be a job? anymore. And for us as software developers, we are 
in an interesting position because we both benefit from this because we build the AI. Right. We're gonna, where we're used to getting other people's jobs destroyed. We're not used to yes, our own jobs exactly, being destroyed. Exactly. Yeah. So we can help that process. But what, what do you think around that? Well, a, 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 it's like there's only way forward, no way back. The Luddites lost too, right? Yeah. Like that's in, inevitable in that sense. Uh, I do think that we are struggling with science fiction addlement, mm -hmm. right? The, there's this idea of emergence of, in, of intelligence that is simply has no basis in fact at all. You don't right? think there'll be a singularity? Oh, I think there'll be a singularity, but I think it'll be deliberate, not accidental. Huh? Okay. Right? They, they, that's a different issue that we eventually, we, you know, that's not AI that's the problem there, right? The real problem is the rate of communication of humanity. So now think more neural lace, right? Like, one would argue that our primary limitation is that we have to speak and write rather than we can communicate with our brains directly, right? Mm -hmm. That's the big advantage that our technology has is that its communications path with each other is so much more rapid than ours. Now, there's all kinds of cool philosophical discussions we get into about whether or not our identity is bound on the limitations of our ability to communicate. But that's not the primary point. You know, your question was, is AI going to destroy us? And it's like, no. AI will become us, right? This, the same way that we harness this as an augmentation of ourselves and we'll harness the visor as an augmentation of ourselves, the ability to make more and more presumptions and assumptions around us will just be amplified by that machine learning. Okay, so it'll just be a helper AI. It always is. All of this has been, right? We, you know, there's not this much different from taking the stick and dipping it to pull out the ants, right? It's just tools. The tools continue to advance. We keep talking about the profound tool that will change everything. It's part of our you know, sort of apocryphal history that someday there will be the robot, there will be the earth standing still. We keep presuming that. It's in the gestalt. It just didn't happen to be true. Right? We won't just accidentally make Skynet. We might deliberately make Skynet, yeah. <laughs> but we're not going to accidentally do it. Right? Emergent intelligence has no evidence. So you will build it. The thing is, we still can't define it. So from a developer point of view, we should be building these helper AIs and, and, and helping we are, the process. Right? I mean, and those things are happening. And you're going to stick with... They, the, the silly part here is, so as much as you've got this sort of bugbear of, we're going to create an emergent, you know, conscious thing that's going to make decisions for us, we can destroy the world with artificial specialized intelligence is just fine. Yeah. And long before we can figure out the big bugbear, it will have cracked this problem and it'll contain that problem. So without a doubt, we have issues on the power they're gonna be able to give to some of the machine learning tools that we're looking at here, and they're gonna need some governance, mm. right? This, but I don't see this as that much wildly crazy. Like That's just the normal progress of civilization. It was only when the car was successful enough that we were upset with how many people were being killed by them, that we started coming up with rules like driver's licenses and lines on the road and where the steering wheel should be and so forth, right? We're seeing that process happen right now with social media. Social media now has now been successful enough that we are uncomfortable with the negative consequences of it and we're starting to develop rules. Right. These artificial intelligence technologies and machine learning technologies, as they are now being enabled and available to the general masses, we are already in the conversations about how do we put governance around this. Okay. Well, at least we're thinking ahead this time. Well, I don't know about that. We're making <laughs> happy noises, right? You know, the other way to look at regulation is it's a way to keep competitors out. Right. Right. So one of the things that's happening as we come down on this, on this idea of regulating social media is the first to be compliant will ultimately be the incumbents. Mm. Which is why, you know, the Facebooks and the Twitter show up at the table when those conversations start. Because this is also a chance for them to lock in their permanency. The same way that car companies essentially stopped evolving once regulations came into place for cars. Yeah. At, you know, so when I look at the OpenAI initiative and so forth, what do I actually see? A list of peers wanting to be at the table when the lockdown comes. And it's the Microsofts and the Googles and the Apples mm. and the Facebooks and the IBMs and so forth. Obviously, right? So this doesn't come without consequence. It's just sort of acknowledging that this is how civilization progresses. And uh, we're going to need governance around it, and we're going to want it. Yeah, excellent. All right, we've got about 10 minutes left. So let's open the questions uh, up to the floor. Does anyone have any questions they want to ask Richard? Adam, straight to the mic. My goodness <laughs> gracious. Uh, I'll ask. Um, you uh, talk about happiness and, um, and growing. I guess they're very similar. Um, companies tried with this autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Yes. Uh, thinking about that, and, and 
just focusing on the autonomy part, mm -hmm. there's different uh, techniques companies try to use. Google do the 20% time. I love your opinion on that. Yep. Um, Atlassian do, you know, one day a year where developers can build any feature they want and try to incorporate it in. Um, at SSW, we have one day brainstorming and then go away for the weekend. Um, have you heard of any good ideas that work, that, that, that give uh, people feeling that they have more autonomy and... Yep. Well, again, we're, we have the distinct advantage of being in the computing industry where we can basically demand our autonomy on, as, as whatever we want. You know, see GitHub, right? Developers build on their own time. I would say the biggest thing that any company can, can put in place, and one that I think is largely going away now, is this idea of if you work for us, all code you create is ours, right? That there does absolutely have to be a line between the things that an individual can create for themselves as well as what they create for their employer. Uh, because often... They want to be creators. That's what they enjoy. And if they're frust, you know, they understand that if you're paying them, you they have to create what you want. And if they don't get sufficient creative outlet on that, they're going to find other ways to do that. And one way to get them to not leave is that they do work on their own side projects in their own way. The question is, as a wise employer, how do I celebrate the creativity of my employees, whether it's work from within or from without? And so... You know, a model on this might be this, bring your open source project to work day, right? That I, because I, just to see how people think, right? I'm a big believer in increasing the level of trust inside of teams, but I've also learned that you don't get to do that at work. Work is where you challenge that trust. You can only lose it. It's very hard to grow it. And that actually the only opportunities that we have to grow trust are outside of the primary work. Now in a normal work day, that's lunch. Right, lunch is the magic time for growing trust in a regular work day, and I, I would presume you, as as a manager, people carefully schedule your lunches because those are the moments mm. where you take advantage of that. But you think about what the those you know brainstorming days are. They're actually out of the regular work loop, but they we are interacting. They are actually, from a value perspective for the company, a trust increase opportunity. Right? That's the most important thing that comes of that. The code is almost secondary to the point. The point where we can celebrate each other's abilities outside of the routine work increases trust. So bring your open source project to work day. What are we doing? We're finding a vehicle to celebrate each other's abilities and explore each other's trust. That'll give you all the value you could possibly want out of that. Right? The autonomy part is get me out of my box. Right? This thing that I do every day, that's the impediment of my autonomy. It doesn't have to be every day that we're outside of that box, but it has to be routine because then I have something to look forward to. Can't wait to show you what I built on the weekend. Right? Those are the moments of release of autonomy. They're also, you know, we, have, we go with all three, autonomy, mastery, purpose, right? It's also demonstrations of mastery because as an employer, you don't actually want your employees pressing against the edges of the skills for the things they're building because those edges are rough, right? I want the most polished product, the most reliable product. You know, those are the things that my customers value. So I tend to ask my employees to work at their 80% level, not their 100% level. But your need for mastery, that demand of autonomy over your mastery, are those 100% moments. And so how do I make sure that that happens still? Is that sending them off to training? which is sort of outside of the process, which is, it works, it's not as good as it could be, or is these cel celebratory moments, right? That's when we get to press against our mastery lines. Awesome. <laughs> um, another thing about um, developer happiness is they often cause themselves to be unhappy with their, um, they can become disengaged or argumentative or not say it in the, the nicest possible way that doesn't cause you know, over bluntness, which causes people problems. Sure. Um, is that a, an area that developers should spend a lot more time thinking about than just writing code and arguing over which way to do their data access? The challenge of dealing with social niceties is you have to deal with it in a socially nice way. So it starts with being an exemplar, all right? The real, uh, you know, now you, but you still have to speak the language of the person in question. 
So we always get back to that primary goal, which is like, what were you trying to achieve with this communication? You know, there's a real art form to being able to help someone understand how to make their code better, right? Right away, you've got this battle of, you don't call my baby ugly. Mm. So, you know, people are already sensitive. The art of being able to persuade, essentially, to say, could this be better? What would better look like? You know, take that time. Uh, I always focus on, with anybody, what was your intended outcome? Do you feel like you made that outcome? What could we do to be better at that outcome? Whatever it may be, right? This is not right or wrong, solid rules around any of those things. This is what were the set of outcomes? Because sometimes confrontation and abruptness is actually getting to an outcome you were looking for, right? You know, I'm kind of known as a charming person that can sort of smooth the way on a lot of things, but I've also found that sometimes the only way to shake things up is not to be that person, is to bang on the table and shout just for that moment of, how did we get here? That's a good question. Now let's have a conversation about that, right? We sometimes need disruptive forces. The problem is if you use disruption as your primary communication medium, we stop hearing it. It just becomes noise. So... All right, the, we are living in a time of limited attention, right? This is our primary constraint. Anything I can do to avoid wasting my attention, I'm interested in doing. The trick, is, so if it's easy just to ignore your noise, that's what I'll do. If it's easier to give that attention, you know, in a way that, that, it, that moves me forward, that's what I'll do. So. You've got to figure out what is, what is the most effective way to hold someone's attention and actually move towards the goal you were looking for. And you need that base layer of trust, like what you were talking about before. And you have to grow it right? to hear it. The number of times I get brought into a situation where people are like, we need to convince these people of X, right? And it's like, well, if you don't have, an, you know, we're going to have to work on trust first before we're going to be even, even able to have that opportunity to explore those things. Mm. All right, excellent. We've got time for one more question. Hey, um, so you talk about being a leader and in a, in a software um, development area um, and as a technical person. So as a consultant, I can't be a leader and not being producing something. Right. Right. Um, so you, you said that when you're a leader, you have to have someone behind you to make it, to make it happen. But as a consultant, we don't have these luxury to only be the leader you have to produce yeah so how do you find the balance between um, being a leader in a team uh, and still produce because I, I I went through a project right now um, that I was the leader and I found myself in that situation where I wasn't being a good leader and a, a good producer so I had to find that balance to to be good at, the, at both at the same time so how do you find the balance well I think you the, the consultants have a number of advantages. One is you're already time boxed. So you can always use the time box weapon. Uh, guys, I'm only here for a week. We've got to get this done. Second is you're an outsider. So you get to point at sacred elephants and go, you guys know this is an elephant. Or it's like, I'm new here. Why do we do this? So, you know, you've got, and, and people tend to pay attention to you because you're new and novel. You automatically get attention, right? These are all the advantages that consultants have. But, you have no time to build trust. So leadership is a mistake because leadership is a fundamentally a trust exercise, right? So you're never going, you do not have enough time to build trust, you're not in that role. So the question is how do you provide value inside of that constraint, whatever that may be. So you take advantage of that novelness and that naivete to press against core things, right? Most of the time, people actually know what the problem is. They just don't want to say it. You know, so that you get, sort of get this moment where you can use that naive day, naive day that I don't have a, a, a stake in this. I'm only here for a short time. They're paying me. How can I give you something? How can I help you in some way? And you can sort of extract that trust. I mean, I've been blunt. Certain people that were blunt types where I said, listen, the boss is going to listen to me on Friday. I can make a pitch for whatever you want. Tell me what you want. And that sort of opens the wheel to this conversation of how we're actually going to get better. My job is not to tell everyone you're incompetent. My job is to actually move this ball forward, whatever that ball may be. How do we do it? You know, primarily as a consultant, 
Your ability to build things is almost secondary to the point. I would worry that you're not writing a good contract. If you're getting into a conflict like that, you're making an agreement you can't succeed at. Mm -hmm. And so you've got to press against that agreement before you start, right? You are never shinier than the day before you start on a job. That's when you demand everything. With the always the, the, impl the implication of, or I'm gonna walk. Like there's no, the, the, I have said, looking at the current requirements of what you have, I don't see any way to succeed, why should we start? Right? And that sort of backs people up, oh, because oh, oh, we actually need to make progress and I have this money to spend and I have no more time to go find somebody new, like it's supposed to be tomorrow, how do we make a deal where we can actually be successful? And you've got to land that deal at the very beginning. But just acknowledge that you have these constraints. Many of them are super useful for you too. You can do a lot with that. The most important thing that you can do as a consultant in that narrow period of time is to get people to think differently about what they're currently doing, whatever that may be. There's a different way to build this, there's a different way to approach this. That particular thing is not truly a requirement, we can eliminate it. Like that is how you get value out of a week. It's such a small amount of time. The challenge is can you learn enough in the narrow amount of time that you have to figure out what's actually holding them back. There are no technological problems left. The technology can do it. Your job is to figure out why the team can't do it. Mm -hmm. You're a marriage counselor. <laughs> That's what you are. So figure out who's pissed and then figure out why. And then find a way to lead them back together. All right. Guys, thank you very much. Richard, thank you for spending this time with us. My pleasure. Cheers. So this was uh, Ulysses and Richard from NDC and SSW TV. Thank you very much.